Well, he doesn't have any lines in the film, so he doesn't need to talk much. <laughs> He'll just write his thoughts down and we can do it in voiceover. Okay, um, hi everyone. I'm Michael. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is so lovely to see this film on a, on a big screen. Um, so, Sasha, let's, uh, let's just start with where the uh, impulse for this film came from. Um, I started to write it in 2018. I, I've been going through an existential crisis. <laughs> um, so it, it just came from a place of a, a deep and uh, profound... You know what? <laughs> um, when I'm nervous, I'm trying to be funny, and it, it's not working. So um, I'll try not to hide myself under the uh, um, veil of sarcasm, and I'll be um, honest and earnest with you. Um, so, I think it came from a place that uh, felt like uh, a deep hole that I wanted to uh, some way fill up. And it, 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 I, I couldn't understand whether in order to feel that, like to fill up that empty space, do I need someone else? Do I need a therapist or do I need a, a partner? Or it's my job uh, to go and dig and find a way how to, to work with that. So I think it came from a place, answering your question, uh, from feeling the sense of emptiness, emptiness that suffocates you. And uh, the way it felt like you have very little air to breathe. And what do you do with that? In my case, it happened to be expressed through the film. If I were a musician, I would probably write a piece of music. And if I would be, I don't know, something else, it would be a different form. It just happened to be this. Um, and you started thinking about this movie before the pandemic, but I think one of the reasons why it hits us now is that we've all lived through this period of like extreme isolation, and so much of the film is about touch and even touching strangers or the, the, the fantasy of, of, of tactile communication with people you see. I mean, how did the, the lockdown and that whole experience shape how, what, what ultimately came out? Yeah, we had to postpone uh, the shooting of the film in, in 2020. We, we thought to shoot it in 2020, in, in May, and uh, naturally it pushed. You know, I was listening to a conversation of um, Hanya Yangihara, who released her book to Paradise, and uh, it's about the alternative version of New York that takes place, one of the chapters in 2096. And it's all about the pandemic and the epidemics. And she said, I started to write this novel in 2017, so it's interesting sometimes how life aligns things, so I also started to write it in 2018, not thinking about the epidemic of loneliness of, or pandemic of isolation as a notion. It's just, it just, the, the time, it just happened. Um, but um, I, will, I want to tap into this, and this is something I talked a lot with Pontus and Jonathan when we worked on this film, and you, Michael, said that. Uh, there are three fundamental uh, connections that we are seeking as human beings. It's an intellectual, spiritual, and sexual. The chemistry, the touch. Uh, we are lucky if we find one or two within one person. And sometimes it can become a partnership, a uh, colleague. It can become a family. If it's a heart-to-heart, -heart, it can become lovers. Rarely you can find all three within one. I don't know if it's even entirely possible or for forever as we evolve as humans like we can connect right now on an intellectual level but it doesn't mean five years later we would be in the same place so when it happens within the human relationship itself like this so yeah like the idea um those are topics to me seems timeless um it did happen that pandemic happened so did i answer yeah, yes, thank you. Um, well, let's talk about dance, because I think it's so unusual to see dance on film, uh, unless you're watching a movie musical or a music video or something. Um, but especially this kind of um, interpretive modern dance in a, in a narrative piece. Um, can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about your own uh, background in dance, and then how, you, wh how and why you uh, decided to... Uh, tell the story with that as the, the, the primary mode of how people communicate in it? Um, I like the dance uh, uh, by nature. It's a nonverbal communication. Um, and 
I've been dancing for the past 25 years. I no longer do. I'm 36 now, and it doesn't work. Uh, but um, when I did dance, uh, Pontus and I met 10 years ago, briefly, uh, while I was studying the Joffrey Ballet. And I was thinking that to use dance, it felt like the right way to portray the, fan uh, the fantasy and to portray the intimate connection. So if I wanted to talk about sex, I didn't want to show sex. I wanted to dance sex. And again, if I were a poet, I would probably do it through poetry and words, but I was looking for non-direct ways of expressing something that is so intimate and so sacred that when you use a banal images, you're losing some, something very special about it. And in, in, in my film, it happened to be dance because it's the language I speak, I understand, and the touch is something the way I communicate with the world. Uh, I, I perceive life through words, but I also perceive life through, through touch and from touch and movement, from, you know, uh, placing a hand on a person, communicating to expressing, you know, with hands and, and movement and rhythm. Well, Pontus, you are also um, a dancer and choreographer who is a filmmaker as well. Your films are uh, The Rain, Labyrinth Within, and Written on Water. Um, how have you sort of combined those two art forms, film and dance? Um, <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I, I, uh, mm, it's, it's hard for me to separate different, different languages. I, for me, it's all, all one thing. I, I grew up being with a little camera, taking pictures of the world. And then I was also in, in ballet school as a young uh, boy and so on. I, mean, I grew up doing lots of things. And then in like creating film, all of these things blend. It's a way of looking through the world through a lens, but it's also using a language that I practiced for a long time. And uh, it's, it's just kind of using, using uh, um, things that were somehow part of my life for a very long time. And um, I mean, one of the beautiful things about film is that, well, apart from the budget, the imagination is really the only thing that kind of puts boundaries. So, so um, you know, in, in a mind that's practiced in movement and practiced in looking through a lens, then it's very natural to just incorporate dance into a film. Mm -hmm. um, and then, Jonathan, what is, is there a particular challenge in capturing uh, dance as you're shooting or even in the editing room? Uh, how, how do you approach it? Is it, is, is it a, particular, uh, a particular kind of cinematography you have to, you have to incorporate to, to, to capture a dance piece? Well, absolutely. I think in the beginning when we started talking about this film, you know, and looking at all the different locations, I think shooting a short film in itself has a lot of constraints. You know, you have budget, you have crew, you have to move around. So I think it, for me it was really just trying to keep it simple in a way and trying to in a way, keep up with the dance and trying to be at the rehearsals as well. I think that was really important for me to just see how they were creating these things. And then I took some of the things that they were talking about. Um, you know, when Adam and Sasha and Pontus and all the other dancers were working, they would say things like, you know, and, you know, this movement is more like this, and it comes more from here, or like there's this movement. And I kind of just adopted like very simple ideas into the camera work, which was kind of like, you know, in the cafe scene, which is, you know, I would ask Sasha, like, what's the, what's the scene about? And he'd say, oh, it's, a, it's about a heart connection, you know? So I would keep the camera kind of at my heart, you know, like just at this level, and then in the subway scene, um, which is more about sex and sexual connection, I just kept the camera very low, almost at my crotch, you know, like just like doing these things and just kind of like seeing where, and then like in the, in the you know, the chest scene, keeping it up here because it's a very brainy idea. So I just kind of kept these very simple rules for myself to just try to shoot it and then, um, and then just asking for more takes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. Um, you know, one thing I noticed, Sasha, is that, um, the film, the film's a little bit out of time. Like you don't see anyone on Grinder, and then at the end, he's you know they're at a at a telephone booth, which barely exists anymore. Well, how do you think about about that? About showing the sort of contemporary queer life that also isn't too contemporary. I think it can be another alternative version of the film where he says on Grinder, I miss you so much, which I can't resist. 
Um, the grinder is a separate conversation uh, but with, or topic, which I will actually come back to. But uh, I think going back to 2018, and this is again when the time and things align, and uh, please don't quote me if I'm mistaken the, the time, but we started to work with Peter, my co-writer on this film. We decided to use the dance. I knew that I want to one location where you can do the confession. You know, it's, some people it can be church. You go and say, you know, forgive me, the fathers have sinned. Uh, it's a form of it. What I did learn, and I'll place in the heart, a place in hand in my heart, is the, I, what I did learn after, which was about a year after we write, wrote it. Um, there was a hurricane, I think in Japan, at some point, And there was a number of people died. I was there. You were there? Mm. Do you know the story what I'm talking about? No. no? Okay, so um, uh, I don't know if you're, real, uh, you're familiar with that part of, of the story or not, but uh, some people had difficulties to work with grief, to deal with grief. So there was an idea to set up the phone booth where people can go and speak to the deceased ones. Mm. And they would pick up the phone and they say everything that they did not. I swear to God. I learned it after I wrote it. But it was so interesting that the timing of the line, and I'm not asking for a credit, so like, oh my God, it came up such a great idea. No, uh, it's, it's not that. It's just, I'm happy to hear that the idea of the confession where you can be true self, where you can be naked, both uh, like literally and figuratively speaking, where you can uh, take the layers off and speak your truth in your own fashion and your own way. So that's where, the, where it came. That's why it felt like, Grinder would be not exactly the same. It would, it would be a different. You would still put some mask on to look, um, to to be, to bring the best version of yourself. And here you don't. You bring the version that it's only one exists of you at that moment. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear from any and all of you about. Well, there are so many locations in the film that are public places. There's subways, parks. You know, being on the along the river. Um, uh, how like on the fly was the shooting and like were there any like complete mishaps like were there strangers who like come up and start dancing with you I mean how, <laughs> how did that play out? You guys go. Uh, definitely a lot on the fly. I think we had the permit to shoot at the park, but you know we were taking over the chess tables, so we really had to work with the, you know the crowd that is there already playing chess. You know, a lot of them would like yell at us. We were like, no, we're making a movie about chess. So like, don't worry, like this is supposed to help you, you know, so. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it was very loud a little bit. Um, and then in the subway, I think it was just kind of like, Sasha scouted out a bunch of stations and he was looking for one that was empty, basically. We found Chambers Street. And it was very much like, um, just go for a take, are the cops here yet? No, like go again, <laughs> like go again. And so, it was, it was a lot of that, just like going to these locations and, and, and trying to steal it. <laughs> no, I think that you... you, yeah, you go. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't I have anything to add about that. We, we're, just, we're just shooting when we can, basically. What do you, did, was, did, was it feel, did you feel self-conscious, like dancing in public places? No. Strange, no? <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, in New York? Like... <laughs> <laughs> You could have set out a little, like a little bowl and gotten some spare change, probably. <laughs> I think one of the greatest thing in this experience, and mind you, this is my first film. I've never done a film before. I worked in a film industry side, but now I wasn't behind the camera, and I felt like my job is to bring the best ones and let them do the work. And uh, Pontus is an established dancer, choreographer, and a filmmaker. Jonathan has experience working with camera and editing, so I was like, okay, you boys know what to do. And then uh, I was just, this is my vision, and you can even um, happen to modify it. So we just went on location, I was scouted a little bit, and uh, happily it worked, thank God. Like, we didn't have anything where we like, oh, but we had once rain, and we had to shut the scene where all the extras standing in line. Uh, that was the hardest one, because I asked to wake up everyone and come at 4 a.m., and, and they did. <sighs> When you ask people, sometimes they say yes, that felt fantastic. Um, yeah, so we were very, very lucky with this shoot. Hmm. Um, Sash, you've described this film as a cry for deliverance from loneliness. And of course, that's something that every human being feels at some point. But um, is there something about, uh, the, uh, about being gay, being 
being queer that you feel brings that feeling to the, you know, puts an extra kind of pronounced emphasis on it? Um, I am gay and I'm queer. It's been a path to reconcile with my sexuality, being born and raised in the Soviet Union and coming to the United States. So it took some time to acknowledge who you are and accept who you are. It's a work in progress up until today. Um, yet there, uh, nevertheless, I tried to make this film as universal as possible. And it was important for me, especially, and that's why the last scene is, to me, is important. To say it's, the experience is not limited to queer people or to gay people. It's a universal, and I really hope that this film would not be seen only, okay, so there are like a bunch of hot guys having a good time. Um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. All I wanted to say is just there is an extension that there are other people who can relate to it. And what was interesting, Michael, when I started to show, show this film in a small circles, I was surprised how women particularly felt connected to this film. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and it, 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 I felt I succeeded. We succeeded in that. So, I mean, like, I'm tooting my own horn. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yes, the queer experience is there. Uh, we mostly had a queer or queer-friendly team working on it, but talked uh, a bunch of times about the last scene. Let's make it feel like everyone can, as I talked today, everyone has belonged to the place where we're at, sitting right now. I wanted that everybody felt included, and, or not included, belonged. And the last scene hopefully reflects that. Um, we probably don't have a ton of time, yeah, do we? Do we have time for like one we audience start, question? We started late, go a few minutes. Yeah, we're okay. good? Well, whatever Sean said. <laughs> Anyone have questions from out there in the dark? It's the moment when you're like, oh my god. Well, do I really have to ask? Um, I wanted to ask what was the most challenging thing for all of you working on a project like this, well, especially for you since it's your first film, basically. Guys, can you answer this question? I will give the short one. To me, it was just until the end believing that we will, it, will, it will work, because at some point it didn't work. Uh, I was afraid that whatever the idea I have will not be translated. And the last scene was first without voiceovers, and my friends were looked at it like, I don't get it. And I was like, oh shit, I've been working on this for five years, and you don't get it. And I'm like, is this kind of a film that requires Q&A? Because I didn't want it to make a film that needs uh, an additional subtitles, you know? After, uh, not subtitles, but the text after, you know, like in a... You go to the museum and you see a chair and you need a you know, two-paragraph description <laughs> why the chair is there. So it, I, I was trying to work on the opposite. Um, so that was the only uh, that I struggled, is to make sure that whatever, and plus English is not my first language, I wanted to translate the message, whatever is uh, there. Yes, can you take from there? Me? You? You go. Oh. <laughs> um, well, m most of the film is improvised to a large degree, and that, that, that just requires that you know, the people that you connect with, in my case, the, the three dancers, you know, there's a lot of things that just have to happen in, on the spot. And, and sometimes um, you have, I have relationships over the course of 10, 15 years, so, and to improvise with somebody that you really know is a completely different thing to improvise with a stranger, so to speak. So I wouldn't say it was a challenge. It was a, it, it's also interesting because it just means that your nervous system is kind of... Uh, very alert, but yeah. Um, I would just say like the time constraints are, it's everything is working against you. So we shot it, I think, in three days. Um, so, you know, I had an incredible camera assistant, Caroline, who's here uh, in France, who were amazing and holding the gaffer. So we just, and we had, you know, that was our team. And we just kind of like ran through all these locations with, you know, Caroline would like pull focus and like spot me, so I wouldn't fall in the subway. So I think just those things were were just the constraints, but it also allows you to work within the same within a framework that you know becomes a language, I guess, of the film. Yes. What have you learned since making this film? You know a lot of people. You have a lot of experience in the industry, but I mean, I'm I'm kind of. I already know some of these answers, like, what's the reality of getting a short film out into the world? What's the industry like? What's distribution like? What, what, 
what, how do you feel right now? Shan, I adore you. You organized this event and you asked the question. This is perfect. Uh, the hardest part, I think, is to... Uh, you think that your film is going to go from here to here. It's not. Uh, it's going to go all the direct and direct ways, and there are going to be some waves when it's up, and you have 120 people in the room, and the next day will be a, a thousands of no's. I spoke to one established filmmaker recently, and she said, I get a, I'm sending 100 emails, and I call them Tuesday rejections, and I'm getting no, 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 no. And it's for everyone, I think, from the, somebody who uh, does the debut uh, to someone who is you know, an acclaimed filmmaker. We all get no's, and you learn to reconcile with them. I have, I'm getting frustrated. My ego hurts, my validation hurts, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, oh, so Lady Gaga. Uh, she once said, remember that? Now we're talking. Yeah. Remember that Oscar complained about, you know, there are 100 people in the room and nobody believes in you and one believes? She talked about the star is born. Like, one is Brady Cooper, it's like, good for you. But uh, honestly, I would be like, Stephanie, look, uh, there are 100 people in the room. They're sort of pretty much all believe. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll take, we'll take one more. Yeah. One more, okay. Dasha, yes. I just kind of want to like wrap it up for myself, and you know this le this film felt like a letter of yearning, longing. That phrase that I've learned from you uh, many years ago, and you were saying that you did it just to fill a hole inside yourself up, but did it like what did it do for you, and did that hole fill itself up even just a little? That's what I, like, uh, what I love life about. You just have to embrace the human paradox. I don't think there's an answer. Or better say, I don't think there's a universal answer. For you, it's going to be different from mine. And the thing is, the answer is going to change with time. In a recent documentary, American Symphony, about Jean Baptiste and his uh, wife, Suleika, who is going through remission and uh, getting cancer again, when she goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you might live, you might not live. And you just see the face of a person doesn't know how to embrace the ambiguity because there is no exact answer whether you're going to live or not. If you place something similar to like, are you going to be long, feeling lonely for the rest of your life? Or someone will come and fill up temporary or forever? There is no answer. I believe so. And my idea, idea of making this film, and for all of us, I, I said them in advance, there is no answer. Let them find uh, whatever answer you find is great, and remember that it might change. Lovely. Let's, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank uh, you, Michael. Sasha, Jonathan, Pontus, Sean, Roxy, all of you guys. If you see a handsome stranger on the subway, strike up a dance. <laughs>